Good afternoon and welcome to Evergreen Talks. The second Thursday of every month at four o'clock, we present Evergreen Talks right here, a monthly Facebook Live event where physicians and providers and specialists present topics that matter to you. Now, this episode is being pre-recorded, so we talk about it being a Facebook Live event. We are premiering this on Facebook, uh, but you will be watching a recording. That being said, we do have questions and an interaction to have with Dr. Powell today. And you can leave questions here as well that Dr. John will follow up with later on. And you can visit evergreenfamilymedicine.com for more information about anything that you hear today. Dr. John, nice to see you. Thank you, Brian. It's nice to see you as well. Well, we'll get into your presentation and I'll come back at the end with some questions and it will no doubt be uh, very interesting and educational as always. So I'll step aside and let you take it away. Well, thank you, Brian. I'm going to talk about medical consent today. It's an essential part of what physicians do, and it seems like really an easy concept. But this obligation has become increasingly more challenging and complicated over the course of the last two years. Why is that? Well, there's many reasons, but most recently, there seems to be self-appointed arbiters of information politicians, media outlets, institutions, and even medical journals have assumed authority to label evidence as misinformation. Political science has adversely impacted the informed consent process and made my job just a little more difficult. Historically, medicine has used scientific method, but did not label complex medical evidence and professional, professional judgment this way. Physicians and scientists just viewed data as evidence. How we weighed that evidence is a matter of scientific debate and professional discernment. It takes dialogue to, and time to reach a consensus in medicine. But it is true that data can be misrepresented. And this has happened. We can also see that misrepresentation of information that was spread by individuals, the media, institutions, and they seem to be poised to punish others for the same alleged misinformation crimes. For example, how did the public have such serious misunderstandings early in the pandemic? In July of 2020, the average guess by a U.S. citizen was that 9% of the population had died. If this was true, this would have represented 30 million American deaths or death toll that was overestimated by 225 times. I believe the data was misrepresented by institutional leadership and media outlets. Fear resulted and policy panic followed. Public health and political missteps occurred and resulted in harm to children, the working class, healthcare access, and the economy. On an individual level, uh, physicians are tasked to inform patients about any intervention that carries risk. In medicine, there are no medications or preventative or surgical interventions that do not carry some risk. So this requires an informed consent process. And where there's risk, there must be choice. Unfortunately, during this pandemic, physicians encountered many patients who had been coerced or mandated to make uh, medical choices. Many have had their jobs threatened, their freedom of movement limited, and have been treated differently than other citizens due to their personal health choices. Physicians are pressured by outside influences as well. I recently read an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled, Reducing COVID-19 Misinformation While Preserving Free Speech. This sounds like a good idea, right? But the article was written by a physician with a law degree and the co-author who is a public health specialist from the Center of Health Policy and Media, Media Engagement, they, they wrote about strategies to legally punish physicians for not supporting the official pandemic narratives or policy. How does this help patients consider the broadest of perspectives? I've been advised by a physician in a, a position of power uh, for an Oregon regulatory authority. 
He reassured me that doctors have a legal right to speak their minds freely in public, and I appreciated his reaffirmation, reaffirmation of this right. But he said, I can discuss the efficacy of, say, controversial treatments, but he warned me that if I was going to attract controversy, I was going to uh, attract controversy, and this is true enough. He added that people who disagree will complain to authorities, and then authorities would be compelled to investigate their complaints. He told me that giving patients misinformation or disinformation is actionable. It is unclear exactly what criteria is used to determine when a physician crosses this line or precisely who gets to decide. This fellow physician added that ineffective treatments in general is a form of patient harm. This is curious because despite the best of efforts, every physician knows that therapies don't always work as planned. If this is the new threshold for a complaint, authorities are going to be very busy. He did clarify one point though. He said that anything that steers people away from COVID vaccination is harmful. So let me make this disclaimer now. Everything that I say is my professional opinion. Others will have a different view and that's okay. My discussion today is not meant to represent medical advice to any individual who may watch this video. Every person should seek out medical advice from their own trusted medical provider and they should expect to have their questions answered as completely as possible before making any personal health choices. The fact that I need to give this disclaimer should be evidence of the challenges that we face today. We live in a tattletale medical environment. So how should a physician respond to these threats? Let me start with a story about my own professional beginnings. In 1993, I graduated from medical school, Oregon Health and Sciences University. It was a great ceremony. The Surgeon General gave the address. It had all the pomp and circumstances that one would expect from a medical school graduation. It even included bagpipes. I took the oath of Geneva at this ceremony. And bear with me because I'm going to recite a few lines from that oath. I solemnly pledge myself to consecrate my life to the service of humanity. The health of my patient will be my first consideration. I will maintain by all means in my power, the honor and noble traditions of, medical, of the medical profession. My colleagues will be my brothers and sisters. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life, even under threat. I will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. So this is my response to the threats. My commitment is to this oath. My commitment did not change because we've had a pandemic or some people and institutions want to make some new rules. Before we talk about the challenges of providing and receiving informed consent, I want to briefly review the points made during our previous COVID discussion in January. Last January, I talked about Evergreen's effort to bend the disease severity curve with early treatment options for patients, depending upon the stage of their disease and not where they received care. I, we talked about uh, a focused protection approach to reduce the risk of collateral harm and as an alternative to severe mitigation measures taken over the last two years. I discussed uh, discuss some of the general concepts of immunity and my concern that recovered immunity was not being counted by public health officials or political bodies. Finally, I expressed my opinion that vaccine mandates represented unwarranted coercion and were counterproductive. Recovered immunity, therapeutics, vaccine mandates are especially relevant for today's discussion. Informed consent discussions are impacted by how these issues influence one's personal risk assessment. As it relates to recovered immunity, Dr. Fauci agreed before he disagreed that recovered immunity was an, 
important factor when considering vaccines. This interview occurred just a couple of years before the pandemic. She's had the flu for 14 days. Should she get a flu shot? Well, no. If she got the flu for 14 days, she's as protected as anybody can be because the best vaccination is to get infected yourself. And so she, she, not get it. if she really has the flu, if she really has the flu, she definitely doesn't need a flu vaccine. If she really has the flu. She right. should not get it again. No, she doesn't need it because the, yeah. it's, the, it's the most potent vaccination is getting infected yourself. So there's evidence of substantial existing immunity in the United States. <clears throat> this slide is from a scientist at the Fred Hutchinson's uh, Cancer Research Institute in Washington. He presented the data before the FDA's advisory uh, committee. And he found that during a 10 week period of the Omicron surge, that 10% of the population tested positive. He estimates that this likely represented 50% of the population since modeling assumptions conservatively estimate that only one in five people get tested or seek out medical attention. But we actually have seroprevalence data now. This week, the CDC announced that 75% of children younger than the age of 17 and nearly 60% of adults have anti-nucleocapsid antibodies to COVID. This represents natural or recovered immunity. That's a lot of recovered immunity. So medical consensus has been aggressively sought by public health officials. This editorial article was published in The Lancet, a high impact medical journal that illustrates my point. It was co-signed by our current director of the CDC. The letter raised doubt about the role of recovered immunity to reach an endemic state. They seemed to believe that the only way to get to this endemic state was through severe mitigation measures and vaccination. This editorial article appeared around the same time as the idea of the focus protection plan was described in the Great Barrington Declaration. The CDC and other government entities pushed for consensus, but it just hasn't been there. Today, there are over 15,000 medical and public health scientists and nearly 47,000 medical practitioners that support a focus protection approach. The NIH advises against various repurposed FDA approved medications to treat COVID. But at the same time, there are over 17,000 members of the International Alliance of Physicians and Medical Scientists that have signed a declaration that early intervention with many available agents has proven to be safe and effective and has saved lives. True scientific consensus requires a good faith discussion and debate. It also requires full transparency of those discussions not hidden from the public or restricted to members of the NIH or CDC policy panels. Worse than seeking a rushed consensus is trying to sell a false consensus and slander respected professional colleagues. Consensus is fine, but it must be achieved honestly. Our institutional leadership claimed to have a consensus that wasn't there. These two physicians and scientists from Canada are commonly named as the founders of evidence-based medicine. They came to prominence when I was trained during medical school. The goal was to bring rationality to medical decision-making, and this is a good thing. It's important to understand that evidence is not science, but it's a tool of science. Science is a method of discovery, and it often begins with an observation. The problem is how do we weigh that evidence? Finding the answer must include a vigorous, open discussion and debate. Now, I've always appreciated my specialty's emphasis on what we call poems or patient-oriented evidence that matters. Let me give you an example. A study that shows that a drug lowers cholesterol is less important than a study that shows a drug prevents an endpoint that matters like stroke or heart attack. I remember as a medical student hearing a debate between two attending physicians. They were discussing two issues, really. One was the value of the physical exam, and the other was the value of guidelines derived from evidence-based medicine. The senior physician 
cautioned that guidelines could threaten physician autonomy and flexibility. The clinicians are treating complex individual patient problems and guidelines could mis be misinterpreted and accepted as medicine's standard of care. He argued that guidelines could turn into a checkbox algorithm process that did not respect the dynamic pace of changing medical evidence, individual care complexities, and the value of direct medical observations. Patient care often demands more nuance and critical thinking than guidelines can offer. There were also prophetic concerns that guidelines could be captured by top-down perspectives and was vulnerable to personal and institutional conflicts of interest. But make no mistake, I'm in favor of evidence-based medicine. But as a physician in the trenches, I'm also responsible to assess if the guidelines are working in real time or not. I need the freedom to troubleshoot and solve problems for my patients in front of me. And of course, they need to give their informed consent. This diagram is meant to depict uh, the hierarchy of medical evidence. The randomized controlled trial is often said to be the gold standard of evidence. And meta-analysis is oftentimes the a grouping of multiple randomized controlled trials or other types of trials. But it means, <clears throat> this means that randomized controlled trials, first of all, are very expensive, they're time consuming. They, re they require sometimes uh, pharmaceutical agents or um, very uh, deep pockets of funding resources that can be NGOs or um, charities. And oftentimes within those entities, we see conflicts of interest. It's also difficult sometimes to find out is the, how, do you, how do you decide if a randomized controlled uh, study is relevant? Well, we need to find out, first of all, do we have a proper size of the study to achieve statistical significance of a particular measured outcome? How is the bias managed? Are there confounding variables that are adequately acknowledged and discussed in the research? So too often though, negative studies are not published unless there's a compelling reason to do so. And recently, there seems to be an interest in designing and funding of randomized controlled studies to show that less expensive repurposed FDA approved medications as ineffective when there are other types of studies that may show the opposite result. I have concerns that there may be competing financial interests due to the medications in the pipeline or existing therapies approved under emergency use authorization. You know, I enjoy reading randomized control studies and weighing the value of the evidence with conflicting research. It's a messy part of science, but if it's done well, the evidence can be properly considered. But randomized controlled studies are not the only source of medical evidence. And I think it's generally understood that it is much easier to, again, to design this study to show that intervention is not helpful than it is to show that it's effective. So we used a large body of medical evidence as depicted in the next slide to help us serve our patients. All forms of medical evidence have relevance and should be considered when managing a pandemic crisis. A physician's observation, experience, and the best available data and research is critical when a consensus has not been reached. Informed consent requires discussions take place about what is known and what is unknown. This process may make this uh, medical evidence pyramid look like a top at times, but informed consent must always pull that string at the top. It's been said that human experience, which is constantly contradicting theory, is the greatest test of truth. If observations are not consistent with the medical dogma, the data, the data may need to be weighed differently or interpreted differently. It's not necessary to stick with a guideline that is not helping your patient changing course for futile resorts, results uh, requires the practice of medicine. These two Australian physicians illustrate how medical discoveries often start with a, a very careful observation. 
many medical breakthroughs are not the result of a randomized controlled trial. These physicians made their discovery a few years before I started medical school in the 1980s. And their story is very compelling. Dr. Warren is the younger physician on the right. Uh, he was looking at stomach ulcer biopsies and he kept finding a very strange looking bacteria in the samples. He brought this to the attention of his attending physicians, but they dismissed it as a, a normal flora, a normal bacteria that occurs in the stomach. But they weren't found in the, in the normal stomach biopsies. Still no one listened. So he did a crazy thing. And by the way, it was an informed consent of one, so he could do this. He swallowed a culture of the bacteria and he gave himself an ulcer. Now the other doctors were interested. Dr. Marshall joined uh, the research efforts and the rest is history. These two physicians won the Nobel Prize in medicine and their discovery revolutionized the way we treat stomach ulcers and gastritis. Careful observations are critical in medicine and colleagues should listen, not dismiss valid medical observations. Physicians who are on the front lines of the pandemic begin to see patterns of disease and what works and what doesn't. These observations are important as they help their patients navigate through their own options. And the informed consent, of course, is critical uh, if we're gonna help patients make choices. So we've been talking about informed consent. What is it? What should it look like? The physician should discuss methods and al alternate uh, means of diagnosis and treatment, especially when invasive diagnostic techniques are utilized. We need to be clear about what the proposed treatment or procedure is and what we hope to accomplish. We need to discuss the risks, the benefits, the alternative treatments, and the potential risks of refusing treatment. Informed consent is an ethical obligation embodied by the oath of Geneva, but it also has a legal component as well. The legal principle of informed consent is to promote patient autonomy, the notion that patients should decide who touches them and how that contact is made. The physician should be aware of too much pressure, too little information, or too little attention to the patient's need for information, understanding, and comfort. A Supreme Court justice by the name of Benjamin Cardozo wrote, every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done with their body. In my mind, this summarizes the problems with mandates. This principle was too easily cast aside. So people want to know, are COVID vaccines sa uh, safe? If you follow the guidance uh, of the official narrative, then this is a pretty short conversation, right? The, the message is vaccines are safe and effective. If I do my job, the answer can be very complex. The honest answer might be in the context of the patient's health, their immunity status, their age, their risk tolerance, then we try to define their own risk benefit considerations and they make a choice. I need to answer their questions honestly by explaining what I know and what I don't know. In my mind, I cannot use institutional strategies or nudges to decrease vaccine hesitancy. Hesitancy may be logical for some people. People want specifics and not slogans. We need to acknowledge that and welcome patient questions, even if it may make us uncomfortable because we have to say, I don't know. These important decisions certainly should not be influenced by lotteries, scholarships, or other inducements. Coercion should not occur by restricting attendance to school or university. People should not have to choose between losing the means to support their family or take a shot. To help us achieve informed consent, we need to have transparent safety data to share. Many are aware of the VAERS database, that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. 
VAERS is a passively reported resource that is monitored by the CDC to screen for potential vaccine safety signals. We are reminded that the results do not prove causality, and that's absolutely correct, except I would say anaphylaxis, which is a condition that usually occurs within an hour after vaccination. VAERS does not have a denominator, only a numerator, but it can and has been used as a signal for safety concerns. The CDC yet suggests no conclusions can be drawn from VAERS, and yet in the public, this is publicly facing data, and the safety signals are concerning from a historical perspective, and I believe it needs to be researched with a little more urgency. The second important vaccine surveillance system is the Vaccine Safety Data Link. The CDC has recently been criticized by the New York Times about their lack of transparency, timely analysis, and willingness to share this data with the medical community and the public at large. The CDC was quoted by the New York Times that they were concerned that premature re prematurely releasing the data might unnecessarily result in vaccine hesitancy. But this resource has been important. The Vaccine Safety Data Link has confirmed the real increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis from these messenger RNA vaccinations, particularly in boys and young men. These signals were seen in VAERS as well, but they were not quantifiable like they were in the VSD link. This type of information is very helpful to physicians and patients and parents, and it should be incorporated into the informed consent process so individuals can weigh their own risk benefit decisions. The third vaccine surveillance system is the best system that's, that is monitored by the FDA. It uses insurance coding information to monitor adverse outcomes following vaccination. It also has a numerator and a denominator in the data, so it can give us some perspective. Again, my concern with these latter two systems is that they lack a regular reporting um, or any transparency to date so that physicians and patients can make the informed choices with the exception of the myocarditis and pericarditis uh, concerns that I mentioned. If public health institutions wanna overcome vaccine hesitancy, they need to execute better and they need to provide the data to physicians and their patients. If it isn't done well, a physician's honest answer may need to be, I don't know, to patient questions, or it will be dependent upon that particular individual uh, physician's due diligence to explore independent research in various stages of peer review. It's unfortunate these latter um, vaccine surveillance systems have not been executed well, while at the same time there's been vaccine promotion, ad campaigns, and mandates. The process has and will continue to hurt the reputations of these important institutions. I have identified a few challenges to providing informed consent. This is certainly not an all-inclusive list, but it's a start. If we're going to find solutions, we need to identify barriers to doing a good job of providing informed consent. Okay, we can go to the next slide. My eyes have been opened in many ways during the course of the last two years. Old assumptions have been challenged. I've always been a skeptic because that's what a scientist is supposed to do. But I've been surprised by the degree of conflicts of interest that exist within the halls of institutional medicine. We need to reorganize ourselves, in my opinion. I want to share just a few thoughts about how we can regain the public trust. The first commitment is to reaffirm our re responsibility to honestly provide informed consent. The second is to avoid top-down decisions by professionals who, in my opinion, are obviously conflicted. The third is that medical research funds should not be in the hands of a few to, to distribute. The process results in self-censorship by scientists to avoid funding sources or to avoid offending funding sources. Research should be decentralized. Paper journals had a role to play when we were not in the digital era. But today, the medical industry complex makes our medical journals look like a race car 
and a NASCAR event with all the ads in them. The editorial boards seem to act like cartels to filter research, research at times. And that counters the preferred, anytime when it, it counters a preferred met, uh, narrative. I found that prestigious journals publish a wide range of research quality, just like the lower tier journals. Uh, peer review should uh, occur at the university level, in my view, and be published digitally for all scientists and physicians to review and critique. Studies that show no benefit are just as important as those that do. Fourth, clinical observations are important and should inform guidelines. Guidelines are important, but should achieve a better consensus by a transparent discussion and debate. Guidelines uh, should not be viewed as commandments because people have biological surprises. Uh, and this fact requires some nuance in their care plans at times. We need our public health institutions, but they need to reconsider and consider the entire health of a population, not just how to respond to a single pathogen. This requires an analysis of potential collateral harms of policy and robust transparent discussions. Medicine needs to reclaim the scientific method and understand that this is more than a randomized controlled trial or a top-down guideline recommendation. We need to stop censoring one another. And we need to reestablish respectful dialogue and reaffirm our professional relationships as brothers and sisters. Ryan, you can rejoin me. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, that is uh, a lot of information. And I think it's very interesting because it comes from the point of view of experience. As you and, and Dr. Tim had gone through the pandemic and offered your opinions and saw the responses <laughs> to your opinions as you uh, experienced everything that we went through over the last couple of years. Uh, so thank you for all of that. Um, what we have now is a list of questions that you have asked or been asked or are compelling questions that get to the heart of some of the things that you just talked about. So we're going to go through some of those and allow you to answer them in order to provide a little bit more depth to what you're talking about. So the first one is how can medical research lead to even more controversy and division? Shouldn't research and stats sort of quell some of this? Yeah, and, and we would hope it would. You know, we would hope that um, that research solves the problem. Um, but for, for folks that have been in medicine for a long time, oftentimes conclusions are, this is what we found, these are some of the limitations of our study, um, and more research is necessary. But the problem that I've seen during this pandemic is a lot of the conclusions were quite categorical that this is what we saw, nothing about, there's some um, more research is needed, et cetera. Um, and as I alluded to in my, my discussion, um, I'm, concerned about the con I'm concerned about the conflicts of interest uh, during this period of time. Um, randomized controlled studies are very expensive to conduct. And yet the National Institute of Health didn't fund those studies. So a lot of outside entities namely pharmaceutical companies or NGOs or charities that may have agendas. Uh, we're, we're funding some of these studies. And um, so I was concerned a little bit about the conflict of interest. I've also been concerned about some, some institutional capture issues. We can talk a little bit about that. So, so in broad terms, research is great. I love to uh, look at the data. But during this time, I've just seen some, some themes. And, um, you know, I, I realize this has happened in history before. Um, science has been politicized. Um, I'm going to reach way back in history again. Um, uh, you can thank me for my, my liberal arts education in undergrad. But so um, in the early 20th century, um, there was a, a scientist by the name of Trifum Lysenko. Um, and he came to prominence during the Lenin and Stalin uh, 
movement of the, uh, the Marxist movement. And he had an interesting theory. Uh, it's called Lamarckian evolution theory. And at the time, there's this other theory going on about Mendelian genetics. And um, uh, this was primarily a Western viewpoint. Of course, there was a lot of tension between the, the West and the, the East at this time. This uh, Dr. Lysenko was kind of an interesting fellow. He was actually illiterate until the age of 13, but he, he really got elevated because he had this idea that you could change either plants or animals or the, or the environment solely could be responsible for changing the outcome of the development of very resistive characteristics in plants and animals. The classic example is the giraffe in Lamarckian uh, uh, theory that over time, you know, the food source was up and the giraffe's neck got longer and we got giraffes with longer necks. Well, it also, his theory was that if you toughened up these crops, these plants, maybe planted them at the wrong time of the year, maybe you put some freezing water on them, um, you know, they would toughen up and future generations would adapt. And you'd have this uh, very robust growth. He, he also thought you didn't need Maybe if you didn't need fertilizer, it would save on, on expense and cost. We know the rest of that story. So during the, during the early 20th century, millions starved because he was in a leadership position. He, he falsified some of his own data. He uh, held on to his views because it was very much in opposition to the Western Mendelian genetic theory, which was obviously correct. Uh, worse though, Mao also adopted that. Millions of Chinese citizens starved to death. Um, so that's that's one example. And I, I kind of alluded to, you know, Nazi Germany's um, eugenetics movement as well. And you know, they they were organized. Their medical system was organized to kind of have a a groupthink process. It was kind of a top down process. Whereas in the United States, where eugenics actually originated. That didn't take off because there was a lot of critical thinkers that said, oh, this, this is bunk. Um, and again, we know how the clean versus unclean uh, process uh, progressed. Now, I, I know a lot of people are going to say Powell's overstating his position now. Totally get that. I mean, this sounds, what are you doing? You know, why, why are you bringing this up? Well, I've got an article actually was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and it was actually that that's like our Journal of the American Medical Association. It's um, it's a high impact journal. And so the article of this uh, journal or the title of this journal was the impact of population mixing between vaccinated and unvaccinated subpopulations of infectious disease dynamics implications for SARS-CoV-2 transmission. It was published by two epidemiologists and one graduate student from uh, the School of Public Health from the University of Toronto. And, um, and the conclusion was uh, that basically being with an unvaccinated person increased, increased COVID-19 risk for those that are vaccinated in this modeling study. If you followed me at all, you know that I'm not a, modeling has a role in science, uh, but it's, the, the accuracy of the of modeling will determine the outcome. But, but the real concern was the conclusion that uh, at the bottom of this, at the end of this paper, uh, they said that risk among unvaccinated people cannot be considered self-regarding and considerations about equity and justice for people who do choose to be vaccinated as well as those who do not need to be considered in the formulation of vaccination policy. It is unlikely that SARS-CoV-2 would be eliminated and that our findings will likely be relevant for future seasonal SARS-CoV-2 epidemic or in the face of emergence, emerging variants. So now I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story about this. Um, so the concern obviously in my mind that this kind of messaging will only fuel hatred and segregation and potential development of harmful policies. That's that's my concern with things that are published this way. But I'm just going to take two assumptions that he made in this simple modeling. I, kudos to him. 
we're actually showing that the model, his ash, his actual mathematic mathematical model. By the way, I'm a big mathematical uh, fan. My daughter is graduating this year with a degree in math. But um, here's the deal. One of the assumptions uh, made is that vaccine immunity never wanes. The second assumption made in this model was that only 20% of the Canadian population had recovered immunity. When actual actual data from peer-reviewed studies that occurred about the same time or just before suggested that that's closer to 90%. So he, if you take even a more conservative estimate than 90% and you plug it into the 20%, the conclusion is reversed. It's reversed. Now, I don't like the conclusion at all because I think the job of public health is to, um, to find places where we can unify around a, an issue, not divide, not to segregate. And um, there's a lot of pressure on, on the journal and these authors to retract their paper. They should, and they should with an apology. So that's one example. Another question here is why are randomized controlled studies considered more important than other types of medical evidence? And are there problems with overemphasizing this type of medical evidence? Yeah. Well, randomized controlled studies are held up as a gold standard uh, uh, for medical research. But there's an, and again, here's, here's my concern about randomized controlled studies. One, they're very expensive. Two, the people that generally fund them are pharmaceutical companies that have an interest in having a specific outcome. And three, there is good data that other forms of studies, such as prospective observational studies and cohort studies, uh, actually correlate very well to randomized controlled studies. And then finally, if you don't think that randomized controlled studies can be designed to fail or to provide a different outcome, you're not reading journals very critically. So let me just take a couple, some ways how a randomized controlled study works. So a randomized controlled study is you take a placebo or a control group and you have a treatment group and you go prospectively through time to find a primary outcome. Does it affect a primary outcome? So during this, the last two years, I've seen all sorts of randomized controlled studies, observational studies, basic research studies. But the randomized controlled studies, first, the first question I, I ask is, OK, who's funding it? Are the authors in any way conflicted? And there's, they report their conflicts of interest. And um, so that's, those are two questions. Doesn't mean the study is no good. It just means I need to have that background uh, of understanding. If you, if you serve on a board of any volunteer board, they ask for your conflicts of interest and rightly so, because it can influence your bias even unconsciously. But um, in this case, I saw no randomized controlled studies that were published in uh, let's say journals of influence in the United States, like JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet or the British Med Medical Journal. None of them occurred in the United States. They occurred in Colombia, they occurred in Brazil, they occurred in Malaysia. And I thought to myself, why, why is that? Our, our national um, institutions of health were not funding those studies. Um, and so then I think, well, Let's take some repurposed drugs. A lot of countries had repurposed drugs over the counter. So how do you screen for that in the control or the placebo group? Um, you might take a, a knowledge of, hey, a repurposed drug, uh, if you take it with a full stomach, has bioavailability of more than 150 times or 150% more than taken on an empty stomach. So why did you have everybody take it on an empty stomach? Why did you have most people start the medication well into the course of their illness? Why do you change endpoints like, let's say, hospitalization and uh, let's say we'll count hospitalization and emergency department stay more than six hours 
as the endpoint that we're going to measure. But sometime in that, it used to be 12 hours, and now it's six hours. Why did that change? How, how come that wasn't discussed? Um, why there, there's a, a research uh, protocol that's very popular right now. It's called an adaptive um, platform where you can look at multiple repurposed drugs at the same time and look at it at the population. And so you can look at control groups, different placebo groups, and you go, well, huh, wonder why this placebo group did a lot better than that other placebo group. And why did you match, match it with that repurposed drug? And you start to ask questions and they don't, you don't, you don't get a, a, a clear response. It's not discussed in the discussion portion. Um, so I've seen all of these things happen. And um, so you might think, well, you, there's always flaws and we expect flaws in design uh, of randomized controlled studies. They're still, I think, very good to do, but you have to be able to, if you're gonna criticize the study, you have to release the raw data. I've seen where raw data is withheld. That's not how science works. Raw data is supposed to be freely shared. And I've, uh, that pattern has evolved. So you can have bias in design, you can have bias in implementation, execution. Uh, the data sometimes doesn't re match the conclusion well. And then of course, um, you can have over uh, what we call data safety and monitoring boards that are unblinded, that can make changes in the study while it's in progress. And there are known conflicts of interest that have been identified. So, so that, that doesn't mean they're, uh, they're not look, worth looking at, they're, they're good to look at. But those discussions aren't happening even within the professional realm. And those that are trying to do that, I'm seeing some troubling behavior. I'm seeing how those uh, physicians are oftentimes um, censored. Uh, they're not, their rebuttals are not being answered. Um, and so I, I'm concerned about that pattern. And so that would be the problem with overemphasizing this type of medical evidence is your point. It should be balanced against some of the other types. Right. So. Um, I've seen repurposed drugs where um, some repurposed drugs may have five or six uh, studies that are randomized controlled studies that suggest that they don't work and they're elevated to journals. And I can see maybe 33 other randomized controlled studies that suggest another one. Wait, but they're not, they're not either getting to publication and they have flaws too, because all studies do, but it's not a, it's, it's not a, honest representation of the data, in my opinion. All right, next up, what are the disadvantages when guidelines become directives and providers are not allowed to use their understanding of the entire body of evidence to inform patients? Well, that's a, yeah, and I, and I, I think that the, 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 plot, the very quick answer to that is um, people get hurt uh, because of physicians are only limited to guidelines or they fear that they there are repercussions from deviating to a guideline. They can't use their own critical thinking skills um, in a way that's most helpful to the patient. Even if a potential therapy is not, um, is not utilized, the patient never gets to hear about it. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, and, I, and I think again, as I mentioned, if you guidelines are oftentimes constructed out of consensus from a certain number of randomized controlled uh, studies or uh, expert opinion, many times those physicians or scientists that are making those guidelines aren't treating the patients. They're looking at the big picture. And so um, I think that needs that that whole observational input needs to be uh, going both ways, you know, that, 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 uh, discussion, it's a dialogue. Uh, a follow-up on that. So I'm just thinking that if you're a provider and you have a certain level of expertise and this thing is unfolding, especially if you want to use the pandemic, although it is such a hot button topic, it's hard to stay objective. I think sometimes, 
but providers are not allowed to use their understanding of the entire body of evidence to inform patients. So isn't there a benefit of some sort of overreaching uh, set of rules or guidelines to use? It seems like there would be a benefit from some umbrella. And I guess that's what we're talking about, consensus. If there's not consensus, then how is there the pressure put on individual providers to make a decision that may or may not be the best thing for their patient? Maybe that's the point of the entire conversation. Well, I, th I think that the, the real key, you're, you're hitting on the point exactly. Um, you don't want people to just be trying willy-nilly research on the patients that's in front of them. You don't want that to happen, right? But many of these repurposed drugs have already been assessed for, for safety. They've been approved by the FDA. So they they have actually more information in, in terms of their safety profile so that I can provide informed consent to the individual sitting in front of me than say things that are under emergency use authorization where we don't have a track record. And so um, there's a difference between quote, experimenting on someone with a medicine you don't know you have had ne not, has not been approved by the FDA. There's been no safety data. It, there's a difference between that. And also, uh, again, using observational data, um, your clinical experience that's evolving in real time. Um, we, we, we pay attention to patterns of disease. Um, and we, we quickly understood, especially in the Delta variant, that this disease was evolving in front of our eyes. As we were looking at chest x-rays, we were seeing, oh, that's in the inflammatory phase. We, we could immediately see that. And we knew what to do with that phase uh, of the disease as opposed to the viral replication phase. And so, so we were making those decisions long before anybody else was talking about it. Um, so I, I think that that's a really important point. We have to explain to the patient what we're seeing and why we are suggesting this might be helpful and explain what the risks are and what we don't know about the risks. That's just, that's still standard medical practice. Next one up is, uh, why is it so important to recognize acquired immunity during this pandemic? You've talked a lot about immunity since all of this has happened. So why is it so important to recognize acquired immunity? Well, the research from Canada uh, is one reason. Um, both of these epidemiologists have no no training in, <laughs> I'll get this converse, conversation quick. They have no training in immunology, okay? Um, and it's, it's apparent, but more importantly, um, immunity, um, if you have immunity, you just been through the most recent variant um, and you're being forced the take a vaccination that I think, again, physicians who are being intellectually honest would agree with Dr. Fauci that there may not be a good reason to recommend that vaccination at that time. But we've made these artificial um, uh, mandates uh, for people to fully participate in society. So it is actually one of the most central questions that should have been answered quite early. And, and the evidence was there quite early, but it was, and it's still at some level ignored. Next up, as a nation and the world, we seem so divided about COVID issues. How can we heal and move forward from your medical perspective? Well, I, you know, that first thing is we don't publish things that I just read um, that add no value uh, to the discussion other than to divide, uh, especially when it, you can change the conclusion with one number. Okay. Um, we have to treat each other like the human beings that we are, you know, sometimes we kind of depersonalize this whole process. Um, and, um, everybody has a story to tell and, and every story is important. And if we're going to, um, shut down conversation, we're going to censor it. People don't get to tell their story. People don't get to participate in society. That's divisive. This is somewhat beyond the medical realm, but it, it's a it's a pattern of behavior that from a historical standpoint, I'm deeply troubled with. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I hope that we can 
look forward and not hold any grudges and just move to the next stage and remember what it was like in 2019. Try not to politicize every statement or every comment. Don't try to make straw man arguments so you can win. Have a conversation, a meaningful conversation. And one more question here. If the COVID vaccine does not prevent getting the virus or transmitting the virus, what is the basis for mandating it? There's no basis for mandating. It's that simple. Mandates should go away yesterday. Um, it's extremely divisive. It's dividing people. It has It's clearly not working. People are, are getting sick. And I'm not going to go into all the details. It's beyond the scope of this conversation. But there's, there's clearly data that suggests that, um, uh, that at this juncture, the, the variants have evolved beyond what we have in terms of vaccine immunity. So I think we need to move on beyond this conversation of mandates. And I'm concerned about they're just going to mandate the next tweak on the vaccine. And uh, we don't do that with flu vaccines. We shouldn't do it with the COVID vaccine. All right, Dr. John Powell, thank you for your time and your expertise. And thank you for watching. If you've had a question that you posted on Facebook as we've gone through this conversation, Dr. John will come back and look at it later. And we will be back again for another Evergreen Talk the second Thursday of the month at 4 o'clock here on the Evergreen Facebook page. Every month, our physicians, providers, and specialists present topics that matter to you. And you can always visit evergreenfamilymedicine.com for more information. All right, Dr. John Powell, thank you very much for your time. And we will see you again, who are watching out there right now, on the next episode of Evergreen Talks. Thank you.